cats to be as large as possible so they can win competitions by feeding them a diet of exclusively the lard. So every day, Lyos goes to the goes to the very you know ultra modern, ultra clean supermarket with you know hundreds of possible things to buy and buys all these huge packages of lard, and um, and he spends the exact same amount every day. He's always trying to um, talk to, to talk up the checketeer or ask her for a day, and she just ignores him and continues saying what the sum is and you know asking for his money. He goes, I mean, he's, just, he's totally isolated, he's totally alienated, he has like sort of no connections. Um, well, I mean, basically, he's always having horrible quarrels with his father. It's just total Oedipal situation. The father seems to be the, rem the remembrance of the communist past, this kind of nightmare of history he can't shake off. Eventually, he has a quarrel. He leaves the father come several days. When he comes back, the father is, um, is dead. The cats, have, who hadn't been fed for a couple of days, had escaped from their cage and torn his belly open and his oh. belly and viscera swirl. So, so what he does is he, he realizes what he has to do. He makes, he taxidermizes his father, and then he taxidermizes himself while he's still alive. He develops this elaborate apparatus so that while he's still alive, his, his body will be cut up and his organs pulled out and, um, and you know, being filled with whatever the taxidermist filters stuff was to be preserved. And this is all again shown us in excruciating detail. And he ends up as a kind of work of art. So there's, there's a final sequence where all these wealthy patrons just in white are listening as the person who discovered his, his state is giving a lecture about an art, compares him, quotes real about the antique torso, because his arm and head have been cut off by the machine, so he's not a complete. And, you know, eventually, so if the fascism part had, you know, no outlet but destruction, the social part had an unsatisfactory kind of cliche, but nonetheless some kind of sense of possible emotive connection to sociality. The capitalist part is about absolute isolation, but with redemption in the form of basically turning yourself into a work of art in this kind of grotesque sort of way. So those are sort of these, so the film just ends there with these three sort of systems and these three alternative possibilities. And again, it, what, what interests me, I mean, it's a, I, think, I find it a very powerful film. I find it's a formal strategy of linking this extreme formalism with this extreme body disgust to be oddly effective because it's so kind of disjunctive. And I think the, the kind of negativity which it leaves us is, again, trying to do what I said before. The, the capitalist fear is not really any more appealing than the, than the socialist one was, and they're both unsatisfactory, but the, fi the film is leaving us with a kind of negation which doesn't give us any positive thing elsewhere. Neither the cozy domesticity in the socialist part nor the turning itself into an eternity work of art in the, <coughs> in the ca capitalist part is really satisfactory, but again, it's, it's posing the limits, it's thinking of these systems as having limits of, and again, of the capitalist system being as kind of weird and artificial as the socialist and fascist systems were. Okay, so um, again, there's a lot more, but I want to get onto the other film at least briefly. I made a chart, actually, because this is the one which I've most done most writing. You sort of have, it's very systematic, and the three regimes, these are the names of the three men, these various um, kind of political regimes, forms of authority, um, forms of entertainment, you know, various kinds of acts which are done, and it's, it, it's, it's kind of, it, I, I think it's very carefully worked out, I don't, you know, in this way, but I'll, I'll pass over that to get to the next film. Okay. W.R. Mysteries of the Organism is an old, much older film. It comes from 1971. It's directed by Dushan Makaveyev, and it's the one film of these three which, because it's an older film, has actually been, there's a lot been written about it, whereas these two newer films basically I mean, when I was looking for taxidermia, there were some articles on Hungarian which I couldn't read, but there was nothing in English, basically, about it. Um, W.R., okay, Dushan Makaveyev, who's still alive, though he's pretty old now, um, has an interesting career. He started out in the late 50s. He made several films in Yugoslavia in the 60s, um, which are very interesting. W.R. is probably his most ambitious film and his most famous film. He made it in 1971. Yugoslavs, under, unlike other Eastern Europeans, were freely allowed to travel to the West. So. W.R. Mystery the Organism is a film which confronts capitalism and communism, um, sex and politics, America and Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. In, in all <coughs> it's kind of, it's a delirious film. It's part documentary, part fiction, part allegorical fiction. It's one of the most extensive, you know, mind-blowing uses of montage in the entire history of film. It's much more than, say, Godard at the same time in France in the 60s. Makaveyev is, I think this film is like the most full realization of a future for Eisenstein's theories about montage, and it develops the possibilities of intellectual montage in ways that I think Eisenstein himself never achieved or even thought of. But 
It's, it's an amazing film. It's called WRS for Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich was a psychoanalyst, follower of Freud, who tried to combine, communi combine communism with psychoanalysis. He sort of got in trouble with the psychoanalytic association for his communism and Marxism and got in trouble with the commun German Communist Party for his psychoanalytic interests. He got kicked out of both. He, of course, had to leave Germany after 1933. He ended up in the United States in the 1950s. He had changed. He had sort of depoliticized. And instead, I mean, Reich is an important figure in various ways. He developed a kind of body therapy. So a lot of, he felt that people had neuroses, which Freud would cure by free association, really were, that symptoms were so embodied that work on the body would help to relieve psychoanalytic symptoms. So he, he, you know, he's the ancestor of various kinds of therapies in which people yell and scream and, and work out, you know, and try to work through their, their bodily constrictions. And, you know, the idea is that you stand a certain way. Rush plus character armor, that's sort of indicating something with your character and everybody does this. and release, you work with the mind, but you also work with the body at the same time. But by the 50s, he had become sort of go, gone cosmic, or what would now be called New Age, the phrase in the distant, and he started to believe in this thing called orgone energy, which was this universal life, life force which stretched through the cosmos and, you know, would revivify things. He claimed it could cure cancer and all kinds of diseases. He made these things called orgone boxes, which were these, like, boxes, big, like little closets, which had, had you know, metal and organic material in layers. And suppose if you went inside, you'd soak up the orgone energy, and this would cure you of cancer. This was judged by the Food and Drugs Administration to be, to be qu medical quackery. So in the mid-1950s, despite Reich's professions of love for America, his adopted home, and support for President Eisenhower, he was arrested, convicted, thrown in jail. Um, his organ boxes and was, were destroyed. The writings, his writing, many of his writings were burned as you know, giving misleading or false quackery medical advice, he died in jail. Um, so the film sort of starts out as a kind of documentary about Wilhelm Reich. So Makovev goes to, you know, Maine where he had his, his laboratory, talks to his, his daughter and people in the community who knew him, gives the sad facts of his, talks both about his stuff, the radical stuff he was doing, combining Marxism and Freudianism in the 30s and the kind of stuff he was doing in the 50s. It expands from that to be a kind of documentary about other things going on in, in the U.S. in the late 60s. So there's lots of shots of sort of Greenwich Village at the time of, you know, the, of the Maxim Hippie flowering. He has interviews with Jackie Curtis, who was one of Andy Warhol's superstars um, in Transvestite. He has, he has discussions about, you know, the new freedom to display sexuality and body parts and the penis from the editor of Screw magazine. He has he has a sequence with a plaster caster. These were plaster casters were these women who mostly took took plaster casts, literally, of the erections of male rock stars. And you see one of these plaster casting sessions on screen. So he has all this kind of diverse kind of sexual, but also you know there's also a lot of stuff about he has a radio American radio on all the commercials, which would have been totally shocking in outre to Yugoslavs at the time. So that's the kind of American part of the film, and there's a lot of other material. The Yugoslav part of the film is a kind of allegorical fiction. It's about a woman named Milena, who you see here, who is a devotee of Reich and proclaims that you know communism revolution has to be amplified by sexual revolution, and the two have to go together. He also cuts in lots of other archival material. So I mean, here's Wilhelm Reich on the left, and here is not Joseph Stalin, but an actor who played Joseph Stalin in official Soviet films in the 40, in the late 40s and early 50s, and he has several sequences. I'll show you one taken from these, like you know, horrifically creepy Soviet films about the greatness and wonderfulness of Stalin. And these are, you know, he also has yes, another thing he has in, in the American part, Tuli Kupferberg, who was a sort of beat poet and one of the members of the rock band at the time, the Fugs, goes around in a military uniform with a toy weapon, sort of going on down Wall Street, and you know. And he's catching the, sh the shock reactions. But here's a passage where he had, where he's, where he has, has his toy machine gun and is stroking it like a phallus, all the while, in, and having his maniacal grin while in the background. And this is on the East Side Highway in New York, above the East Side Highway in New York City. Um, all the while in the background, one of the fuck song, which is played repeatedly through, throughout the movie, "Kill, Kill, Kill for Peace," um, which is there, which made during the Vietnam War, and sort of their satire on official American ideology. So that's the. That's the American part. The Yugoslav part, I said, is more narrative. It's a kind of fiction. It's, it, so Milena, who is, I showed you before, makes these stirring speeches to her whole apartment block about the need for sexual revolution and you know communism is completed in orgasm and things like that. Um, but the plot is, although although she 
um, she calls for sexual revolution and disdains what she calls the red bourgeoisie, i.e., the you know the ruling class. That we, in US, remember, Yugoslavia has a kind of unique position in the communist world because in 1948, it's, it's the only East European country where the where the where the Sov where, which became communist without Soviet troops. Um, so it was a native communist movement which was resistant the partisans which were resistant against the Nazis, and they they liberated the country from Nazis and set up a communist regime. In 1948, Tito, the head of the Yugoslav government and communist party, breaks with Stalin and declares Yugoslavia to be neutral. Um, so you have a situation in Yugoslavia where it's the Stalinists who are sent to the concentration camp instead of the anti-Stalinists. Um, he sets up he sets up a new government which is, is, is supposed to be more authentically communist, but very quickly it became criticized. In the 1950s, a guy named Milovan Gilas, who was, who was the number two man to Tito, became disillusioned with the dictatorial nature of the regime, wrote a book called The New Class, in which he said that the capitalist class had been replaced by a new class of bureaucrats who had the same kind of privileges and things like that, for which he was sent to the concentration camp for many years. Um, so, there, so there's a lot going on with with Milena's dissociation of what she calls the red bourgeoisie and the way that you know class privilege and inequality are being renewed in communism. I should say that what happened as a result of this film was that um, it, it was banned. In, it was shown in the West. It was banned in Yugoslavia, and um, Makadev, the filmmaker, was kicked out of the Communist Party, which is actually a member of up to that point, and strongly and, and told in no uncertain terms. He, he was basically told. You know, nobody in Yugoslavia is ever going to do a penny to make another film ever again for the rest of your life. You might really want to go to the West instead of staying in Yugoslavia. Things would be nice and nice, so he went. He made one other very radical experimental film in the West, um, Sweet Movie, which is an amazing and provocative film, shot with, shot in, in Amsterdam, but with Canadian money, I, I believe, um, which also poses this kind of apocalyptic confront confrontation between the horrors of capitalism and the horrors of communism. Um, he then couldn't get money to make any films he wanted. He made a number of other films in the 80s and 90s, but they were all kind of more commercial projects than he normally did, or else very low-budget projects. And so his career was essentially snuffed out by the official disapproval of these two <coughs> films. But anyway, um, so Milena, the, the Reichian revolutionary, for some reason finds herself in a strange attraction to a Soviet visiting artist who's an who's a, who's a artistic um, ice skater. And she finds him admirable and attractive, and she starts going after him and trying to seduce him. And he is kind of sort of nauseatingly pure and high-minded in his devotion to communism and stuff like that. Um, I should probably show you the next clip, which, which, I mean, this is after she's always spent half the movie, and also show you some of the juxtapositions which, which the film gives us. Ja živim za svoju umetnost. Čovjek ne može u životu raditi sve što mu padne na pamet. Mora se posvetiti jednome, ustremiti se ka jednom da. cilju kao koplje. Poleteti kao strela. Pazite. Moj rad režime celo, bez ostatka. Ne može se živjeti polovično. Nije časno umirati iz ljubavi. To je sebično, buržovski. To je životinski zoologizam. Meni se ovdje kod vas sviđa. Priznajem, mnoge stvari ne razumem, ali vaši ljudi su divni. Mislite i na žene? 